Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. If you're an entrepreneur or a small business person, or you're thinking about becoming one, this show is just for you. I'm Doris Nagel, your host for the next hour. I've counseled lots of startups and small businesses over the past 30 years, and I've helped start or started on my own a bunch of other businesses. I wish I could tell you that they were all wildly successful, but unfortunately, that just would not be true. Over those 30 years, I have seen and made myself a lot of mistakes. So the show has two goals. First, to share helpful information and resources. If I can help just a few of you out there not make some of the mistakes that I've seen or that I've made myself, then I've been successful in my mind. The second goal is to inspire. You know, I found being an entrepreneur confusing, often lonely. Sometimes you have no idea if you're on the right track or not or where to turn for good advice. And I always found that talking with other entrepreneurs was a wonderful way to get back some of that inspiration and confidence. So every week on the show, I have guests who are willing to share their stories and their advice. My guest this week is Laura Gallagher. She is the founder of The Creative Company, and she's going to tell us in just a minute what that is and who her clients are. So Laura, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to The Savvy Entrepreneur this week. Well, thanks, Doris. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'll start out by answering your question. The Creative Company is a full-service uh, marketing and public relations firm. We've been in business for over 30 years, and we help companies and nonprofit organizations when they're building, growing, or changing. Wow, well, that covers a lot of territory. Who are most of your clients? Are they are they nonprofits? Are they for profits? Are they small? Are they big? So, because how companies tend to hire us is that they tend to outsource their marketing to us. So they might have a few people or a small department in the house. They tend to be of a, a certain size to be able to, you know, to afford that, quite frankly. Yeah, right. Uh, we work with leaders. We work with companies that are led by values. We work with one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the United States. We represent uh, one of the leading affordable housing providers in the United States, uh, builders and contra- and uh, architects and you know, community developers, really, our tagline for a long time was building community around your brand. So we think a lot about pulling people towards your brand, like advertising is a push. Public relations is a pull mechanism. And to do that, you have to have a great story. And you're seeing Google. Well, Google is a great example, actually. Google is a pull mechanism. Like there are people out there searching for things, but you have to make sure that you can be found. And to be found, you have to be telling a great story. So the storytellers like you and me, (laughs) and they really hold the keys to the future. I love that because I think most of us small business people, and I definitely include myself in this, have spent a lot of money on marketing. And I've had this conversation with other uh, small business people and entrepreneurs, you know, you feel like it's just throwing things on a wall and wondering what sticks, you know, it's like, uh, should I do a podcast? Should I have a billboard? Should I put my, my logo on a bus? You know, I mean, I, there's a million things you can do, right? But I agree with you that it starts with the story first, because You can throw a lot of stuff out there. You can spend a lot of money doing it. But if you don't have that compelling story, you're spending a lot of money that I'm not sure is going to go anywhere. That's my observation. That's a good observation. That's the power of branding. Good branding is always associated with an even better story. And that's what that's the magnet that pulls people into the story in terms of, you know, the pain around spending money on marketing and you're not sure which thing to do. And especially now, my goodness, there's, you know, when, when you and I were starting our careers, there were, there was television and radio and print and billboards. And now there's so many channels, right. so many places to advertise. Where Absolutely. do you begin? And it feels, it can feel very overwhelming very quickly. Yes. My recommendation to the people listening is to, Remember that people who are closest to you are most important. The people who are closest to you are most important. So your job as an entrepreneur is, first of all, to make sure that your employees are solid 
and know the brand and know how to represent you well. That's your first mover advantage, really. Making sure your team knows what's going on. Then you go out to your clients and make sure that you're communicating well with them. You know, do you have regular updates that you're sending them? Are you running your business well? Are your processes and systems in place? All those kinds of things. And then you'll find that over time, you know, they tell similar kinds of companies about you. So word of mouth is one way. But then you also have to have your sort of halo over your brand, you know, your website, your... Somebody called it foundational marketing. And I think that's a really good way to put it. It's like, you know, you're building your house and you got to have certain bricks and mortar in place in order. And I don't mean a building, but I mean the foundational stuff like you're talking about, right? Yes. We talk about that. Actually, it's built right into our logo, Doris. And for your audience, your foundation is so critical. And then you can add in these other things and it doesn't feel chaotic, but it makes sense and it draws the right people towards your brand. But if you don't know who you're talking to, what you're talking about or why they should do business with you, that isn't going to happen. On the other hand, if you do, you do that hard work, that foundational work on the front side, you will be successful at drawing in the people who have similar values, who want the same things that you want. It's just, it's an easier path forward. I think that's great advice. So Laura, speaking of stories, talk a little bit about your own. How did you get involved with the creative company and what, what in your background led you to want to be part of a a small company like that? Well, I started the company when I was a senior in college. What? Come on. Seriously. So that was 35 years ago or something like that. It was when women weren't starting businesses. So 1988 was the first year that a woman could legally get a business loan from a bank in Wisconsin without a man's signature. Without a man's signature in 1988. And I started my company in 1989 with 21 books from the Madison Public Library and a vision. Wow. What what in the world led you as a college senior to do that? I mean, I was focused on... um, Ooh, I, I hate to think about what I was focused on when I was a senior. I was uh, probably partying too much and trying to get those last uh, last parties in and last events for the for my senior year. I wasn't thinking about starting a business. How did that happen? Well, I had a consumer behavior professor who uh, his name is Mark Dedman, and I was working for a PR firm. I did their billing. I did some public relations. I was pretty good at it. And he said, you know, you could start your own business. And this was partially because he had wanted to and had not. Uh, He later does, but he had not when he was my age. And so he said, all you've got is a car payment and a student loan. You aren't married. You don't have any other responsibilities. You should just try. I think you could be successful. And that was all I needed to. And then I also, I grabbed, you know, I started reading about being a business owner. And I thought, oh, this could, this could be good. I didn't, you know, looking back now though, Doris, I wish I would have spent 10 years working under somebody else. Uh, I didn't make much money. You know, I was, I struggled for a long time. I had to learn a lot of things that, that I could have learned, you know, differently. Um, What what kinds of things did you end up learning on your own? Everything, everything. (laughs) You know, and I think that's, you know, just everything, everything. How to hire people, how to, how to bill, how to manage cash flow. I mean, I guess there's a, there really is a lot. And I think that's one thing that people who start their own business for the first time start to realize pretty quickly is you may be great at a subject or a particular skill and maybe your business idea is a perfectly wonderful business idea built around that, but, <laughs> but there's so much other stuff that so you much have other- to figure it out and, and be semi-competent at or your business is going to crater. Right, right. Well, and don't you think, Doris, that most of us start businesses because we want to do the work we love to do? Absolutely. And then- But then we realize to run the business, you don't get to do the work. You're sort of naturally running the business and we need to decide what we want to do. And that's where I think uh, people get disillusioned. People end up 90% of women-owned businesses are themselves and maybe one other, 90%. 
That that and, is one of the hallmarks of women business, by the way, which is different than necess- than the majority of male owned businesses and makes it last time. Yeah. Last time I looked, it was 83% of male owned businesses, but all these folks are really they're What they're doing is that they're creating giant jobs for themselves. Yeah. They're lifestyle businesses. If, if, mm-hmm. if some people will say, and you know, I know people sometimes use it like pejoratively, like it's somehow lesser than a business that might go IPO or have venture capital investors. I think that's a okay to have a business that just supports you and your family and you do what you want to do. There's nothing wrong with that, but um, it certainly does play into the statistics about how difficult it is for women to get venture capital or angel capital, because if your business idea is just you and you know, your computer or whatever, uh, you're not going to probably attract that kind of funding, right? No, no, you're not going to attract that kind of funding. It's It's got to be scalable, which is something I didn't really think about until I went back to college when I was like 47. I got a scholarship from Babson, from Goldman Sachs to go to a uh, program called 10,000 Small Businesses at Babson College. I was part of the national cohort. So they flew me to Boston. Oh, at the wow. Beginning. Yeah. At the beginning of the 16 week program, this is open, you know, like all, all women and men guys, you can apply too. there's different. uh, They're always diverse. I there's two, a couple of programs that Goldman Sachs sponsors. One's called the initiative for competitive inner city. I graduated from that one in the fall of 2016. And then I did Babson and uh, 10,000 small businesses in 2017. So there's scholarship. You learn all about how to run a business, scale a business, hire people, fire people, manage people, lead people, all the things. It's compressed. It's hard work. It's really hard work. Like I think even though the scholarship is worth 50 grand and they flew us out to the executive center and we were like, we were at the beginning and the end of the program had amazing, it was an amazing program. And most like 98% of us graduated, uh, not like 98% of us do graduate from the program because it's set up for our success. Uh, but I would say it probably cost me fifty thousand dollars to do it. Why so? How, how so? Because you're away from your business. Oh, right, right, you're, right. It, you know, so it costs me money to go do that. There's no no doubt about it. And I think that's one of the sunk costs that not really sunk costs. It's co- It's just a cost. It's an investment. And I, at least I had the scholarship, right? So it wasn't like friends of mine who got an MBA who took a different path and then get their executive MBAs at some point along the line. They're doing both. I yeah. didn't have those kinds of resources. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and we've been very successful. I was, we were in the top 2% of women owned businesses in terms of gross sales when I was in my thirties. Wow. And, yeah. And then the recession happened and then I changed direction and started doing more web development and social media. We were early. You're, you're talking early about in- the 2007, eight. Yes. Recession. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That really yeah. affected my business in a major way. Our sales dropped significantly like i don't know 70 percent or something what why do you think that was such a because, huge job oh because we were doing retail and uh, so we don't do much yeah. retail we actually don't do any retail now yeah. uh but that was the segment that really got hit it was automobiles and jewelry and you know these uh, furniture you know quite frankly like all the things that people weren't buying during a recession yeah, and all the things that are still on uh, shaky grounds. I mean, you, yeah. I just read another article last night about all the retail businesses that are on shaky ground. A lot of uh, common names, you know? Absolutely. I, I think for all of us who are listening right now, if you've been to a, a Penny's or a Kohl's or, you know, yeah. whatever your Macy's or anything, there's it's, a, it's like a ghost town in those places. Yep. yep. Every mall in America. Oh my goodness. What are we going to do with all these malls? You know, I know, I know. Well, uh, so talk just briefly about how your business has grown over the past 30 years. I mean, you started with you and you and your, you and yourself. And now where, where are you? I mean, I was in, I hired college students. I hired people I was going to school with, you know, for six bucks an hour, seven, eight dollars an hour, whatever it was. It wasn't much money um, back then. And now it's a totally different thing. I mean, we have, I have a team of eight employees and we do, 
you know, video production and web development. And we're really like a full, sort. we are a full, we are a full marketing department, but if you just need to outsource, you know, you don't need that full time. That's, a, you know, expensive price tag um, and the responsibility, but you need to ramp up something quickly. We're all geared up to go. We work well together. Uh, we invest in team building. We have a couple of different trainers that come in and work with us on knowing and understanding each other. And then there's also, you know, continual investment, both in community and then in ongoing training and everything from crisis public relations to account management. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Well, you know, we were talking before the show and uh, one of the things about your background that I thought was really interesting is that you, um, you spent time working uh, to, was it the, I think it was the first Wisconsin's Women Entrepreneurship Day. Talk a little bit about your work with that organization or that event and, and um, what, what led up to that? So there were two, we ended up producing, I produced two events in Wisconsin and financially backed them in 2017 and 2018. What led up to it was my holy discontent around the state of women in business and the fact that I was in my late forties and just really learning and thinking about things like scale. Yeah. That's what led to it. I went to New York city to graduate from that initiative for a competitive inner city program through uh, Goldman Sachs at the at Columbia university and through online search, I looked at the United nations and realized that this conference was happening for women entrepreneurs, a global conference and so I bought myself a ticket. I went to the VIP party. Where, and this was in New York? In New York, yeah. I bought myself a ticket to the VIP party too, which was unbelievable. It was on Park Avenue and it was, you know, Lottie Da and all the things. And then um, applied to be an ambassador before I left New York, was accepted, went to Babson, and then started working on a conference here in Wisconsin for women, you know, by women. And it had to be diverse inclusive. It had to represent all the different sectors. I mean, it was the most, one of the most powerful things I've ever done in my entire life. It was also, you know, costly. It took me away from my core business. There are a lot of lessons learned, right? For, you know, and for the rest of the audience, it, it just, you can't do everything. And I, I think that that's probably been one of my challenges that I want to do it all. You know, I just think that so much of it is so fun, but we do have our limits. So. <laughs> well, it's not only fun, but it fills a giant gap that's out there. Yes. It's obviously worth doing. One of my past guests on the show was a woman named Heather Wentler, and you may know her. Oh, yeah, I know uh, her. She talks about how she and her co-founder tried to organize, I think, a breakfast and it was wildly successful. And yet even Heather, I think, if you listen to the interview with her, is pretty candid about the fact that it just takes so much energy and so much time and so much money. And she's even a little cynical because she got a lot of money up front because obviously women helping other women entrepreneurs is a great story, but she's like, you know, and, but then the funding gets hard because you're not new and sexy and cool anymore, you know? And I thought, wow, what a harsh reality. I mean, the need is still there, but to make oh, it was, kind it was, of it was go, yeah, it you was, gotta, you know, you gotta like keep creating new buzz. Absolutely. Uh, and I think to your point though, there is definitely a vacuum in terms of what women, I I'm a very connected person in this community and in the state. And I've served on a national board for the national retail federation. I am connected through counselors Academy to all kinds of folks. My point is that even though I knew I felt like I knew a lot. I didn't know enough. And there was a vacuum. There is a vacuum for women entrepreneurs. It's just, it, it wasn't until Babson, Goldman Sachs, you know, those programs came along that I began to think about business differently. You know, and that does lead to me, like creative company was Dane County small business of the year last year. I won the governor's business team. Thank you. We won the governor, or I won personally. My pandemic project was the governor's business plan competition for an entirely different business idea. And I give credit to, you know, those experiences that I had those that training later in life to winning that. I haven't done a lot with it, but I just started kind of pulling some gears in that direction for a company called Mathetria Press. So, well, yeah. So, it's just, so yeah. that's an argument that once you've done this, you've got 
incredible skills, even if your business wasn't all that successful, yours is, but even if your business wasn't, you still have the ability to almost replicate it, you know, take a new idea and is kind of what I hear you saying. Well, and it's about how you think about it. You know, if you think that you need to be an integral part of daily operations versus setting up a company that operates without you. Like, I think the way of thinking is really important. I've always felt that I wanted to be integral. I wanted to be needed. I wanted to be part of this. But now I see, as I've learned over the years, not just now, but there are so many people that do things better than I do and in different ways. And I need to, my skill set has really needed to change over the last five years so that we can be as successful, so that we are, and it's resulted in us being pretty successful. But I've had to think about it in terms of me really developing other leaders and getting out of their way instead of me being like, oh, I don't, I don't know. It's probably ego, you know, where I felt like I needed to be in the room or something, but. I don't know. I think there's that. And certainly feeling needed it helps a lot of us, you know, through our days, you know, because we're not always appreciated as much as we'd like to be. I think that's true of most human beings. But I think also it probably speaks to the original creative energies and vision you had for your business, which obviously changes and has to change if you want to scale. And actually, you know, we've been working on a history book for a creative company because I'm at that stage in my business where we want, you know, we want to document some of these things. We we built in a brand new space a couple of years ago and a brand new building. And so we used to have this big history wall. Like you'd walk into a creative company, you'd see the history as you oh, walked cool. up the stairs. Yeah. yeah. And that was lovely. Well, now we just have a much smaller wall. And so I said, well, let's just turn it into a let's take these images and and, uh, stories and things and just put it into a book that somebody can just kind of look through as they're waiting in the lobby or whatever. Right. Yeah. As a slideshow, you know, it, who knows, I just want to make sure we're training and onboarding and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's really looking back over the last, you know, 35 years. And one of the things, I mean, really what I envisioned in the beginning was what, where we're at now. So I, it's aligned. It's just, it's just taken shape in a lot of different ways over the years. So, and I keep, you know, refining it and making it better like an artist would, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. You know, it's interesting. I saw somebody um, not too long ago had written an article about how a lot of people, when they start a business, they envision linear growth. You think, oh, well, you know, and, and, and I don't mean a straight mm-hmm. line, but you know, maybe it's very, it's smooth. You kind of, kind of start slow for a while and then all of a sudden it really takes off. And he said, actually, most businesses are like these squiggly lines all over the place. <laughs> they are. And that, that certainly fits with my experience. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that like yesterday I hired someone two months ago, part-time and they quit yesterday. Oh no. Yeah. That was kind of a bummer. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we have a 60 day period where either one of us can say this isn't working, you know? And she looked at the situation and said, I want to just design. I really don't like doing the, this isn't for me. This agency environment isn't for me with the pressure of billable time and, you know, all the things. And I, that's a mis- like in the past, first of all, I wouldn't have had a 60 day. Let's see if this is a good fit. I wouldn't have right. had a trial. I wouldn't have known to do that. So that's a good thing. I want people around me who want to be here and want to do the work. Don't you? Doesn't everyone? Right. Right. And so if it isn't a good fit, we want to know that early on, but it's like, you have to be able to adapt to things that aren't in your control all day long, all day long. And I think that the irony is that when I started this company, I did it because I wanted to feel like I was in control. (laughs) Isn't that something? That is really something. One of the things that I found really interesting about Laura's background is that she helped sponsor and organize a Women Entrepreneurship Day in the state of Wisconsin. And she was telling us before the break a little bit about how that came to be. What was the purpose of that day? What goals were you trying to achieve with that event? 
I was trying to give away what I wish I had known earlier. You know, I was trying to equip and empower other women to thrive. And so I brought together the best of the best, the best leading entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in the area, women who had scaled their businesses, uh, (laughs) women who taught about business, women who were, uh, who could help us to be equipped. uh, And also organizations like the Wisconsin women's uh, it's, it's a business estate, you know, funded thing, a business initiative, the um, SBA, you know, everybody that was, that should be at the ta- the small business development center at the university. Yeah. Of Wisconsin, you know, all of those folks were either speaking or had a booth. Uh, and I think that was one of the challenging parts for me is that in terms of economic development, I didn't, I did not approach this. So I didn't get the support I had hoped for from some of those smaller groups. And I'm talking about like 250. How are, how are we supposed to be successful if you're going to give me $250 to put on a day like this, mm, you know, yeah, and the ticket yeah. and tickets I undercharged. So I made, I made rookie mistakes, even though I was part of a network of women doing this around the world. Our Wisconsin event was the best uh, well-attended full day conference in the world. Wow. Congrats and, on that. Holy bucket. That's saying yeah, something. It is. I, they do, they do a remarkable events all over, but we, ours was all day long. And I actually feel that we could have rented out even more of Monona Terrace and done more. But again, I did, I made these rookie mistakes. I didn't ask for the funding that I really needed up front. I tried to do it fast because the first one was in November. And I thought the first one after I had, you know, was ready to actually launch and pull the trigger. I started in July. So in 120 days, we were at showtime. And what not, year was this yeah, again? 2017 and 2018. Yes. I was thinking, I've had a lot of guests from the state of Wisconsin talking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem and how, you know, there's all these people trying to make it thrive. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's at a different place now than it was then. But honestly, from a cultural change standpoint, that's not that long ago. It's not. And, you know, the tech council was there. People were present. But I think if I did it again, I would invite American Family Insurance or some other large sponsor to come in yeah. who has a, a vested interest in what happens with these women and would would write a large check. Quite frankly, yeah. some, my largest sponsor was Summit Credit Union and they paid 20000 for the sponsorship. And yeah. it just really wasn't, it sounds like a lot of money. It's not. Go ahead and try to feed everybody 400 people, you know. Oh. Chia seed pudding, snacks, and, you know, all the things, like, and the beautiful lunch, you know, and all the things, the Monona Terrace. I mean, we did this in a very, I wanted it to be first class because that's how we should be treated. If you're willing to take this risk, I want you to be treated well. But yeah, and then my mom died after the second conference. Uh, Yeah, so that's, that is one of the reasons why I just said, okay, I got to just, I need to slow it down. But again, I took it on myself. And I, and that's the lesson to learn too, is that, I, and I, I did and I didn't. Year one, I had very large and diverse advisory board because that's what they recommended. But having 19 people that you're reporting to in addition oh to the conference. I, not I, a good I had an old boss that referred to that as herding cats. It was, it was, hor- and especially for someone who was not used to that. Like I just did not handle, I didn't, didn't do it well. And then, or I didn't feel like I did it well enough. And I didn't, it was too many people. It, they were an advisory board, but it was, it was a lot to manage. And then 2019 or the second year I did it, 2018, I had a much smaller advisory board that was much easier to manage. Uh, but by then I was doing things, you know, as a North American ambassador. And so I was helping women in other countries get their events going. And I think this is the thing that I want people listening to understand is that you can sucked into this volunteer vortex that you did not intend to be sucked into. And pretty soon you're needed and you're valuable and it's fun to be with all these amazing people and you've taken your eye off your core business. Yeah, yeah. So now well, I've been and, back and also, to business. And, you know? and also there's, there's you know, uh, there there's something to be said about scaling these events too. So in other words, if you are integrally involved and you're kind of the only person with these events. Well, you, you pull Laura out of that and they don't ever happen again. And that sounds like that's kind of what's happened. 
And so if your goal is to have it be an annual event or every other year, you have to think about it differently almost, right? Like scaling your business. Well, I think, yes. And I think it could have gone on in a different form, but I had invested so much in the brand at that point. I wasn't willing to just say, you know, here, take all the, all the intellectual property and things that I have. Yeah. And I wasn't sure when I do it again. And I think that's the other thing is that don't think that because just because women are often underestimated, undervalued at the table. We know we get paid less. Don't do that to each other. And that was the other thing that I found is that we do that to each other. We can't and just- don't, And don't do it to yourself, right? No, because... and don't do it to yourself. I did, I did it to myself too. It was, not, it was not an entirely pleasant experience on a number of different levels, but it was a lot of work. And, I'm, and I know that- you know, 100% of the attendees reported they'd come back. 98% would recommend what again. 50% of the respondents were more likely to uh, get funding, which is one of the issues that women have is that they yes. don't want to, they don't get the capital up front to be able to do what they need to do with their business. Right. Um, it took me years before I got an SBA loan. Yeah. And then I, became, wow. and, then I and then in 20, actually, because of this conference in 2019, I was recognized uh, with the SBA's Women in Business of the Year Award. You know, so that was a win, but then I really needed to get back to my core business and make sure that it was solid. And so that's been my focus for the last, you know, five years. And then we did a build out here. We're working with, I'm really developing my team. Like I'm taking all those things at Babson and instead of turning around and giving it away, I'm using it to develop my own company, my own clients. You like me, it sounds like are wired up. I mean, the reason I do this show is because it bothers the heck out of me uh -huh. that women entrepreneurs struggle. Uh, and and I know they struggle because as you and I talked about before the show and that I've mentioned on other episodes of the show, I have a hard time getting women entrepreneurs to be featured on the show. I, I tell a story of a, a women venture capital partner. There aren't that many of them out there. They're still mm -hmm. unicorns, right? When I asked her, I said, you know, I, I'd love for you to be a guest on the show to talk about venture capital and how you got into it and what you think women should be doing. She goes, well, I'm really comfortable speaking on a panel. So she said, you know, if you have a panel, let me know. I, I literally, I, I'm not even sure what I said. I probably said something really stupid because I literally could not believe that one of the few women venture capital partners wanted to be on a panel because she didn't feel comfortable putting herself out there by herself <laughs> on her own merit. And that's, my mind was just, it was blown. It was, <laughs> so Doris, I don't even know what I said after that. Yes. I, I mean, my mother always taught me, for example, that a lady shouldn't be in a bar by herself. Yeah. Right. And it's the same kind of thinking that says, I don't want to be out there. Oh, I don't deserve to be out there. That's the other piece of it. Maybe. But I think part of it is like, I don't want to draw attention to myself. It's not. And yet it's, 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 it's necessary if you want to. And also it's helpful. I, I mean, there's two ways to go at it, but I think, you know, if you don't draw attention to yourself, then no one can say, oh, she didn't do this. Right. It's like, it's a desire, I think, to be perfect sometimes too, or to be seen as really competent because it's risky to be known, you know, at this right. stage. And so you better, life, so you better get it exactly right before you step out mm -hmm. into that spotlight, yes. right? And it makes us very anxious. I'm sh many yeah. of us and myself yeah. included sometimes. Uh, to think that somebody's going to think I'm less than instead of more than enough, you know? And yet it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I shared with you, it's difficult to get women entrepreneurs on the show. So any of you women entrepreneurs and small business people out there who are listening, raise your hand. Your story yes. is worth sharing and I would love to share it, but I, it's just, you know, I, I, try. I, I would estimate it takes about three times more effort, uh, at least twice as much effort to get women entrepreneurs as guests on the show as it does men. Because women are far more likely to cancel at the last minute. They're more likely to ghost you. They're more likely to um, uh, just, uh, 
not return your phone calls, not return an email, even when you tell them, you know, here's what I, I really want to feature you because you're one of the people who are helping make things different and better for other women entrepreneurs. And I can't tell you the number of, of people I connect with or try to connect with who don't even say, not a good time, but I really love what you're doing or thanks for reaching out maybe another time. I, I just, you get nothing. And, um, and when it was men, I just, I laugh and I laugh because I, almost to a, to a fault, I have to say, men entrepreneurs, their business idea can be dumb. They can be inarticulate. They basically can puff it up and make nothing sound like it's just the most amazing, you know, next, next big thing. And they have no problem getting in front of a microphone and being in the media. None whatsoever. None. Right. I I know. And so how, you know, how do we help? How do we help other women short of organizing these incredible and amazing one day events that are really expensive and frankly take either a whole committee to organize or a paid person that someone pays to actually do that. What do we do instead, do you think? So first of all, to your point about us not tooting our own horns, I produced that big conference and didn't put myself on the stage. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So typical, right? So typical. I didn't put myself on the stage other than I think, you know, to be thanked kind of at the beginning and the end or like something like one of the the major sponsor thanked me and had me on the stage for that. Year two, I did a vulnerability exercise at the very beginning to let every, so that, and that everyone in the audience joined me on with uh, one of the leadership coaches we work with at creative company. And that really helped set the tone. So I think part of it is, you know, like one of the questions we asked was, what are you hiding? What are you trying to hide? What are you, oh, I love it. What are you most afraid of? You know, what, and one is like that my husband will divorce me if I start this business. You know, it was things like that. Really? People wrote that. People wrote these things on these sticky notes. And then at the break, they put them all over the walls. So we had 1200 sticky notes, letting everybody know that everybody's afraid of something. Everybody wants something. Everybody, you know, hopes for something. Like, I don't remember what the three vulnerability questions were, but you could see that we were so much alike. And that just broke down all the barriers. Ah, it's amazing. What a great exercise. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, and that's through Giant Worldwide. And uh, Dr. Tom Nebel was, is our local coach in Wisconsin. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that we knew that I'd researched ahead of time was that most of us lack confidence. So we wanted people to feel more equipped and more confident, and more empowered, you know, to go and do things. But part of that is like knowing that you're in a room with people who also you know, are, are concerned about things are scared about things, you know, like I didn't, I I don't want anyone to know that I didn't graduate from college or, you know, I feel like I'm not equipped to do this or, you know, whatever the thing is, but just to know that. And then you build each other up. You ask like, what's the solution? Um, You build each other up. And by the way, a year or two, I did put myself on the stage as the final keynote. Good for you. So I did. Yeah. And that was, that was really great. We had go girl. There's learning (laughs) right there. That was really powerful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, and I think at the core, I probably am a teacher. So just being able to, I just wanted people to walk out of their, you know, learning and, and things like that. Yeah. Building yeah. each other up. I mean, that was what was so powerful about it was that, you know, I think, I think that, and I'm going to go back to the gender specific thing, but men play on teams where maybe they're a little more rough with each other and they might, you know, say things that, I don't know. And maybe they're used to like also maybe encouraging each other too. But um, for women, I don't know. We just, it helps. We, play, to we played up. with dolls sort of in parallel, but not really as a team, you know? Yeah. Which makes us great. Actually, like we, we can be amazing leaders because we do understand sort of the dynamics of that's going, that are going on in the office. And we know when everybody needs to go outside and play or we know when everybody needs to buckle down and do the work, you know what I'm right. saying? Right. Right. And just intuitively, like we kind of, I think that, and I'm sure there are men who do this too. So I want to be careful, but uh, just, yeah, it's, uh, and I, I do believe that 
that there's wonderful balance when we can get everyone working together and bring all of their strengths to the table. We, That's yeah, what we, we need we need goal. all of that. That's the thing that is um to me is amazing is we need women's talents because we're less than we could be. Just like we we need you know, I know people some people make fun of the rainbow idea and stuff, but I, honestly diversity is just practical. It's an ecological concept and I don't know why people resist it, but it we you know, species become stronger through diversity if you study ecology at all. And I don't know why it, it should be any different for human beings. Well, and when I went back to school at Babson, which by the way is the leading entrepreneurship college in the country, and it's also very expensive if you go there as a student. But in any case, they what Goldman Sachs had set up was a very specific ecosystem for our success. So we were in pods of eight. That's really important. Who, who, if you're a listener right now, who's your pod of eight? Who are your eight people that you're kind of traveling with? I think that's, you know, that's based on community. And then we were part of a larger group of 48. We had, and then part of an even larger group of 147 and ultimately part of 10,000 businesses, you know, this big network. So we talked about network a little bit before the show too, Doris. And I think, or networking. Um, mm-hmm. We also had a peer partner and a coach in the program. So I had somebody else who was also in business. Um, he was he was running a technical company on the East Coast uh, and my peer partner was. And then I had a, a business coach that made sure that I got through the program too. Well, I guess it just shows you it does take a village. And mm-hmm. what, one of the things I seem to have noticed, maybe I'm just thinking about myself too much, but I think women struggle more with networking than men. And they certainly, according to studies, don't reach out as often for help. Maybe it's because they are told to figure it out for yourself or viewed as a sign of weakness. I don't know. What what do you think about that piece of it? Is that the case? And anecdotally in your experience, and if so, why? You know, it's very interesting because I think I've seen men struggle with networking too. I think it has a lot to do with how we're wired. I'm a connector. I'm a natural connector. I just am. So I, I I just think I'm curious. And I would say that maybe that's part of it is that it feels maybe less, doesn't feel nice or something to, to be out there networking. It sounds like, oh, I'm making money, which might not be a, a good, you know, like, a phrase that you're comfortable well, with. Also, also that you know, you're asking for stuff like, you know, don't you want to buy my car? Look at the features and benefits of this car. Don't you, don't you need this new car? Ew. <laughs> no. Ew. Right. It feels that's, well, I was going to use the word sleazy. That was the one that came to mind, but that's not what it's about. It's really about being curious about the people that you're meeting and finding out what they need. And, you know, it's about them networking isn't about you. And I think when you think it's about you, I mean, it can be about you. What I'm trying to say is that it's, (laughs) it should be like, it's balanced. It's if you go into it thinking, I wonder who I'm going to meet that I didn't know before. What am I going to learn about them? And then, you know, being, it's okay to say at the end of the conversation, Hey, by the way, you know, we've shared what each other does in our businesses. If you, if you happen upon anyone who needs what I do, please connect us. Would you? And they will, they will. Like it's that simple, but it's having the language. I think we sometimes don't have the language just because there've been women and men that I've networked with for years and I still don't know what they do. I don't know how to hire them. I don't know how to, this is part about like, we started the conversation, Doris, talking about the, about having your systems and processes in place, about knowing what your foundation is all about. And your story. And your story. So if you don't have your story mapped out when you're in those situations, you can't share it with someone else. They can't help you to uh, tell your story, share your story and draw people into your story. Right. So true. So true. No wonder you're a marketing whiz. Um, What do you think? um, You made it clear that probably this event isn't going to happen again, or at least it probably isn't going to happen with you spending the kind of time and money you spent in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think anything like it will happen again? Should it happen? Or what should we be doing in the interim? Are there other kinds of events that we ought to be thinking about to help other women? There are lots of 
opportunities online. Uh, it's I noticed that American Express has a program. I think it's called Dwen, and that's a a group to an opportunity to learn with other female entrepreneurs. I do think that um, you know most cities now have some sort of something, and there may be multiple opportunities. Uh, to learn. There's there's so many. We're, we live in such, like when I started my company, I had to go to the library to get a book to find out how to do anything. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not like that now. There's countless no. communities. But I think what we're missing is the community part of it. Yep. The in-person, uh, you know, conversation. There's another woman business owner that I talk with. Her business is much, much larger. It's a family business that I talk to at least two or three times, a, well, two to three times a week. We're, wow. we're on the phone with each other. Yeah, about all the things. And that has really helped me to be a better, a better boss, a better business owner, you know, all the things. You have to have somebody that you can, if not several people. I mean, I, I probably, you know, I have a nice handful. I probably have eight people that I can call and say, you know, like, so I guess that's a question for the audience. Who are your eight? Who are your eight people yeah. you can call about various things that aren't going to charge you? And yeah. who and can they call you too? Because right. they have this as well, but it's, I mean, it's got to be mutually beneficial. Uh, but that's, we really are, I don't know that guys necessarily have this any, any, I know we've been focusing on gender, but I don't think they necessarily have it. It's just different. It's like they might go golfing, which is I was just, I was just thinking of that. My brother-in-law yeah. is, he, his, his, connections if you were to kind of map out his little like network of connections they all stem from the, the golf the golf uh mm -hmm. club is kind of you'd see it was the hub of all of that and then from that there are spokes out from there it, whether it's the guy who paints his house or does his roofing or uh that he hot you know it does his hiring for his company i mean it's all it's all there that's exactly for him that's that's the center of his world. And so if you don't have a golf course question is what do you have? Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's actually kind of been always been a little thorn in my side, the whole golfing thing. Cause I'm like, I, I know everybody's out there doing business. Yeah. And if you had, I have, I would rather have my children than a great golf game, you know, but because I have two kids, you know, the idea of spending when they were young, they're not now they're both in college but uh, of spending, you know, four to six hours away from family yep. after working all week, it just isn't going to happen. Right. And I, love, I do love that they, you know, play and, and, and then figure out how to work together too. I think that's fantastic. I, you know, and I don't know if pickleball is going to do it for us, Doris. I'm just being honest. I, like, don't, I don't know. I'd like you to know, believe it. Maybe, yeah. I mean, well. we, we need places like that too. And I think it's just, it is, it's the reason why women probably, aren't as responsive when you're inviting them to be on the show. It's because they're trying to juggle a whole lot, especially at a certain age. So like right now where I'm 55 years old, I run this company. I got another one that I'm kind of getting off the ground. Um, you know, my, I've lost my mother, my dad's still alive. Um, but there's all this like family stuff that's happening yep. on both ends of that, that right. women tend to carry the bulk of. So yep. there's a lot of, you know, th there isn't, it's not, like we can do it all. And I think that's one of the mess. That's one of the things I need to learn still. And I have to remind myself, I can, like, I would be, we love doing the women's entrepreneurship conference. It was a, an amazing, amazing experience. It's just that we need to figure out how to make money at it. If we could have figured out how to, you know, if it, if it would work, you know, if we could figure out a different way to do it, it could be a really wonderful, you know, thing to continue to do. Right. So, uh, but you can only do so much. Right. Right. I mean, I, you could envision it being something that people from other states come to visit and say, how did you do this? Show us how to do that. Well, yes, I could help you do that. Consult with you for a fee to, to help you do that. You know? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we, I was North American ambassador. So, I mean, these, this event did happen in other parts of the United States too. Uh, and so, yeah, we were all helping each other to make the most of our events. Uh, but it was just a lot. I don't know, Doris, yeah. you can't do that and run a business. Like I couldn't not, at least I couldn't figure out a way to run anything on that scale, you know, but I think that's the other part is that like, we can do small things well too. And I'd rather do small at this stage and age, I'd rather do small things well and enjoy my life than trying to do big things and feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. 
Are there organizations out there that you've seen or read about or heard about that you think are doing a particularly good job of this at a small scale? No. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I guess that that just means um, you've you've given me energy to get up and do the show again next week because <laughs> uh because at least i i know i'm out there every week uh promoting women and their businesses and giving people an opportunity to share stories so you know like i said it's given me energy to to keep doing the show so Laura, one last question before I let you go. We're almost out of time. I feel like I could chat with you probably for another two or three hours, but tell people how they can get in touch with you or learn more about your business. If you've said something that sparks their interest or something about your business they'd like to learn more about, tell them how they can get in contact with you. So certainly you can reach out to me on LinkedIn I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn and uh, anyone who's listening right now, I'd love to love to connect and learn more about what you're up to in the world. The Creative Company uh, website is thecreativecompany.com. I am uh, writing and publishing two more books this year. And I, you. yeah, thanks. And I published one. No more. In- St- stop. Tell people what you've already written. So I already wrote a book. It's called 180 and 120, How to Recharge Your Business in 120 Days. And you can find that on Amazon for, I think it's $14 in black and white. You can also get it on Kindle and download it for like $4 or $5 or something like that. It's a, it was actually the Amazon deal of the day within the last like three months or something. You could get it for little or nothing. Awesome. Um, Or you can get it. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say uh, you can also you can get it you know through creative company too but yeah, yeah. so you're wor- so not only those but you're working on two new ones I am and so th- these are more personal projects I bought my my great uncle's house and I've been restoring it and over the last since three months and I have been so I'm working I've already I hired an illustrator and designer to take uh words I've been writing about this process of of sort of going home again. Uh, and I love it, it. It's, it's how to, because it's, especially as a, a single woman, you might think, Oh, should I take this on? Uh, it's, it's an old house. It needs a lot of work. And so I'm just walking people through the process of what I did and how I, how I've done it. It's, it's lovely home. Now it was not when I bought it, it needed a lot of things. Uh, so I, it's, it's, and I've got a good following already on and having a lot of fun with it and taking some, uh, that is it. awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll I'll be watching that as it evolves. That's that's a bit, that's you. very cool. Well, I, we need to take a we need to wrap up for this week, folks. Uh, Laura, thanks so much again for joining me, and uh, I appreciate all of your insights and learning about your journey as well. Thank you, Doris. It was a pleasure to be here and keep telling those great stories. Keep inviting women to tell those great stories. You are a difference maker. I'm thankful for you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, too, to all my listeners. You are the reason I do this. Uh, You should check out my website, which is www.thesavvyentrepreneur.org. You'll find there all sorts of uh, past episodes of the show. You can download them or listen to them on demand for free. There's also an increasing library of blogs and tools and other free resources. I'm moving more content over there every day. So take a look and uh, also check out my Savvy Entrepreneur YouTube channel. It's called the Savvy Entrepreneur Radio Show. Again, you'll find lots of past episodes of the show with phenomenal entrepreneurs and amazing people just like Laura Gallagher from today's show. Now, be sure to join me again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. But until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing you happy entrepreneuring.